So you're trying to win a 2024 best ball draft, a fantasy football championship, especially this early in the calendar. You probably need to know where the edges are. What players do we need to draft? What situations are maybe changing? We're going to dive into all those potential edges. Probably saw on the thumbnail, there's Kyle Pitts again. Oh, no. Is Kyle Pitts an edge? We're going to dive into all the different potential edges we can get in these early drafts, especially on our good friends, drafters, drafters, fantasy. And then we're going to try to put them to use in a drafters early NFL best ball championship draft with all you guys, all the sickos here on Spike Week. Let's do it. Hello, hello, Blindles, Bin, Blindles. Hello, Bindles, GM, 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 Bernie, Billy. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Another, we, we said yesterday, there's no breaks in NFL best ball season. We are not, we are not going anywhere. We're going to be ripping tons of drafts, even here in February, March, April, before the main, the main slate of best ball season happens tonight. We're riding solo, but we're going to be drafting over on our good friend Drafters Fantasy. If you have not signed up for Drafters, they have an awesome, awesome early NFL best ball tournament that's a little bit different than, say, our good friends over at Underdog. Of course, we've already been firing tournaments like the Little Board and the Big Board on Underdog, and those are kind of your traditional uh, playoff format best ball tournaments, meaning... You draft in your 12-person league. You just need to advance out of that 12-person league, right? Um, make it to the playoffs. Survive a couple of playoff rounds in weeks 15 and week 16. Make it to the championship in week 17. And that's when you compete around against you know around 500 people or so, depending upon the tournament. Take home, hopefully, the top prize in week 17. On drafters, it's a little bit different. They use a cumulative scoring format. So... We draft, or when we draft a little bit later, there will be 12 of us, myself included, myself and 11 others. We will draft on drafters. And that league, once the draft is over, doesn't matter. You draft against 11 other people in that draft, and then you compete against everyone in that tournament to score the most points across the entire best ball season. So right now we're going to draft a team in February and the whole focus is to draft a team in February that somehow scores a shit ton of fantasy points, you know, in September and October and November and on into December. Pretty wild task, but that's what we're here to do. And that's what we do. That's why we're sickos, as you see at, uh, at the top of your, 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 your screen. And as Billy says, it's sicko time. Let's go. What food is going to be discussed today? Well, we'll see. There's no Rob today. It's just me. I'll try to, uh, uh, not offend too many people with more uh, food takes. The Philly folks, I don't think, appreciated our show last night. Go back and check that out. Um, and go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button while, while you're here. And check out last night's show where we drafted a team on underdog and also maybe talked a little bit about how the Philly cheesesteak is a touch underrated. Um, we've made our soup takes well-known. Sorry for the soup lovers out there. <clears throat> but... Um, before we dive into uh, uh, the drafters draft, hey, like I said, if you've not signed up, I, I highly recommend it. I think if you're sick enough to be listening to this show here in February and excited about 2024 um, fantasy football and best ball already, having access to different sites and different formats of tournaments is is awesome. I, I love what Underdog has put out there with the big board and the little board, but drafters also offers us a little bit of, of something different where we don't have to deal with kind of the advancement structure. We certainly don't have to deal with week 17. It's a little more of there's plenty of strategy. Don't get me wrong, but it's a little more of how do we flex our muscle on kind of being the best fantasy drafter period. And um, see every time Rob needed to be here because uh uh, he's the one that reminds me always to put my phone on do not disturb before I uh, start this, you know, this, this show every time. And I forgot yet again. So we got a phone call, but we got it all figured out. I'm, I'm, I've only done one drafters draft, but I'm, I'm really interested to dive in a little bit here. And I want to talk super quickly before we hop in the draft 
<clears throat> and with all you guys here, I'm sure we can fill one of these babies uh, pretty quickly. And yeah, just, just you guys are nailing it. Jim, a.k.a. Jace. <laughs> Jim, a.k.a. Jace. Best site to draft is drafters. Uh, quasi hearts drafters as well. Ben, shout out to you for being a sicko. Bernie, different player combos are emphasized on drafters. And speaking of our guy, B. Kurt, um, I want to pull up really quickly something for uh, specifically that Bernie has put together that is a part of our NFL Best Ball Almanac for 2024. So there's a, a link in the description to that if you want to get access to it. <clears throat> Myself and Bernie and other members of our team are constantly updating from now until the end of the 2024 season. So we will be supporting in-season tournaments, right? DraftKings launches a new best ball tournament every single week. We'll have rankings for that and, and analysis for that. We will have best ball resurrection on underdog. We'll have in-season tournaments on drafters. Everything will be supported here from within this almanac. So you buy it now for $69.99, a one-time purchase fee. You get all of our analysis, all of our rankings, all of our content for all these sites for that one fee from now through the end of the year. So a little biased, but a, but a pretty good deal. But something from within the Almanac I wanted to pull up um, that I thought was just awesome and a great kind of segue into some of the edges that I think exist uh, specifically on drafters, but just generally speaking right now in uh, the fantasy landscape. Um, here's the article. So again, the folks that have access to the Almanac can go in and read this in the Almanac Hub, but Bernie put this together. Drafters early best ball championship 2023 in review so there's a ton of awesome information here you see i'm scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and you can see the player combinations and uh you know adp movements and rookies and all that kind of stuff is in here awesome awesome stuff from bernie but i mostly wanted to look up uh the winning lineup because i think the what won in a best ball tournament a lot of the times it gets a little bit um overused and over analyzed because it's one team out of hundreds of thousands, certainly thousands, tens of thousands of teams. And we draw a lot of conclusions from the like really hyper specifics, right? Oh, this guy won with a zero running back team. Kareen won with two early running backs and three quarterbacks, right? Herzig won with a hyper fragile team and Liam won with a, a Josh Allen team and Felix, won, right? And blah, 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 blah. And everybody looks at those teams and really fixates on what won. And it's honestly, it's a lot more about what the market did and what was successful, like what was successful, what could have been successful in any given year, as opposed to like the actual team that won. But then we fast forward to these early tournaments like we're, like right now, and nobody looks at what won. Like everybody's going to analyze the winning Best Ball Mania team, right? It, we're going to analyze it. You guys are probably going to analyze it. Tons of other sites and analysts are going to analyze it, and and it's that's fine. But everybody's going to dig into it, and not a single soul on the planet is looking at what won the big board or what won this drafters early tournament. And so I loved looking at this, not because we need to just copy paste what this team that won was, because of course that's not true, but seeing specifically kind of the combination of players. I love the spike week percentage here on the right-hand side, like what collection of players ended up coming together to win this early drafters tournament is extremely fascinating. Very much not surprising that the first two picks were the, the combination that won a lot of tournaments, CD lamb and Amon Ross St. Brown, right? The uh, one, two turn was just, it stayed healthy. Amon Ra and CD and Devonte Adams as well were good to great to at least good enough. While a lot of other players um, got injured, you know, underperformed, what have you. So that's not really anything too profound seeing that CD lamb and Amon Ross St. Brown won. <clears throat> where the edges start to come in is as we start to slowly scroll down here and from an early tournament perspective, the first like kind of edge that pops out to me is realizing how you don't have to be perfect. <laughs> like look at this team. Let's just for the audio listeners third round in the drafters winning early best ball championship team, Ramondre Stevenson. No one would classify Ramondre Stevenson as a, a home run pick last year quite the opposite probably 
Round four, Mark Andrews. Okay, while he played, but missed tons of time. Terry McLaurin. Not awesome. <laughs> uh, Sam Howell was okay for fantasy. Not especially great for Terry McLaurin. Not a great season. Mike Evans, pretty good. Dak Prescott, very good. James Cook, okay. Couple couple big spike weeks down the stretch, but again, you see in the right hand column on your screen, just twenty six percent spike weeks. So he he wasn't. He had a couple of really big games down the stretch that I think uh, from the the playoff format tournaments make us think he was more important and more impactful than he was, but it really was kind of unimpressive uh, over the course of the entire season for James cook relative to a lot of what else was, was out there. Um, AJ Dillon. If you listen to last night's episode, I like to give Rob a little bit of shit for AJ Dillon, zero spike weeks for AJ Dillon, Jared Goff, pretty good, but still even Jared Goff is as solid as he was. And as solid as the lions were just 15% of his games were, were spike weeks. Then we start to get into some fun and some, some chaos. Khalil Herbert, actually a little bit better. I think than the market probably gave him credit for Zeke. Uh, not especially awesome. Also being paired with Armandre is pretty interesting, but Zeke ended up being a little bit impactful down the stretch, just providing a couple of spike weeks. And, uh, like usable weeks as well when when Ramondre went down. Michael Gallup, an absolute stone cold zero. So we are now on our third, our second player who provided zero spike weeks. AJ Dillon, Michael Gallup, nothing. Hayden Hurst, absolutely nothing provided us. So that we're onto three players, three players that provided absolutely nothing to this roster, right? Then well, we'll scroll down a little bit past those next guys. Joshua Kelly. Chargers, Joshua Kelly, nothing. Did absolutely nothing. Devontae Parker, nothing. All 0% spike weeks. Those guys added no points to this team. Now, what did happen, though, is the big hits, right? You see at the top, CeeDee Lamb, Amon Ross, St. Brown, 72% and 74% spike weeks. Pretty, pretty helpful, right? Mike Evans, Dak Prescott, very, very helpful. Then it goes, you have to wait till you get to Adam Thielen, who had 24% spike weeks. And obviously everybody remembers he was very good to start the year. Nico Collins, awesome, awesome pick. And then at the very end, Jake Ferguson and Kyron Williams. So we talked about this last night on the show, which I highly recommend going back and um, listening and sort of in, in the intro being like, you have to understand that even if you win one of these tournaments, not every single pick that you made is going to be a home run. And quite frankly, multiple picks on your roster, even on a winning team are probably going to be certainly net negatives, but possibly total stone cold zeros. And that's what happened here. And this team won a cumulative scoring format tournament had to beat. Uh, let me scroll up really quick. Uh, Bernie can probably, oh, there we go. 11. So there's had to be 11,000, 207 other teams in total points from week one to week 17 and had a bunch of stone cold zeros and not only just a bunch of zeros, Mark Andrews, fine. Terry McLaurin, fine. James Cook, fine. Khalil Herbert, fine. Zeke, fine. Like not a lot of smashes, but what happens when you get CD and Amon Ra and Dak and Mike Evans and Kyron Williams and Nico Collins, right? There's your five or six guys. It's like, you just need to not screw it up around them. And so uh, as Bernie pointed out here, we see a, a, a very fun two, seven, eight, three, and only 5% of teams drafted in this structure. And that's one of the first edges, not this specific structure, but that's one of the first edges I wanted to call out is thinking about your structural ways to approach your drafts right now that the field is maybe not doing as much as they should. And the funny thing about this team is if, if the winning, I mean, not like the winning drafter cares, they got first, so they don't care. But if you remove Hayden Hurst and you say, I took Mark Andrews, I can just take a punt second tight end and hit on Jake Ferguson. And I have Mark Andrews and Jake Ferguson and I toss Hayden Hurst out and I add another wide receiver or running back. This team's actually even better. Like this team could have been much better, much better. 
but it took a unique approach with the seven running backs and eight wide receivers and only two quarterbacks. I'm not going to give away the whole article. Go check it out when you get the Almanac, or if you have the Almanac, go read this because I promise you you're going to learn some stuff. But the, the market just doesn't take certain approaches, especially on drafters and especially in 20 rounds where they're very unwilling to only draft two quarterbacks, certainly only two quarterbacks when the seventh, the first quarterback comes in round seven, Dak Prescott. And this team honestly was still unwilling to take only two tight ends, despite the fact that they took Mark Andrews in the fourth round. And so there's another way just from a structural perspective that we can do something that we know can win, right? Less picks, not less draft capital necessarily, but less roster spots on the onesie positions. Because when we have 20 rounds and in these early drafts, when we have, you know, so much uncertainty, like so many free agents and so many rookies, we don't know where guys are going to land. We don't know if any of these rookies are any good. We may not even know who these rookies are. When we have that uncertainty, our opponents gravitate to the certain things, which is a lot more of quarterbacks. And tight ends, because I know that I can, right. I can attach Hunter Henry to a team. And like, even though he's a free agent, I feel confident like Hunter Henry's good. He's going to land on a team. I don't have to worry about that. When I draft um, Malik Washington on a team, like you can love m- m- my analysis as much as you want. You can love his yards per route run as much as you want, but it's still, it's a, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. I think the leap of faith is one of our biggest edges that we can make right now in, in these tournaments. And I thought that this team really started. I mean, you see this person drafted Kyron Williams in, you know, the spring time during March madness before any of us probably listening to this, watching this or talking about this really had the, the, wherewithal to dive into the Kyron Williams streets. So hits on that hits on 19th round, Jake Ferguson. If you recall, Jake Ferguson skyrocketed up over the course of the summer, you know, to rounds 12 or 13 by the end and hits on just enough around it, right? Nico Collins round 16, big time hit, big, big, big time hit, but your hits what are what become the monster edges in um these these super early tournaments um that i thought go check that article out from bernie when i'm done here i'll make sure and put a uh a a link in the description let me really quickly just pull up um something else from within the almanac uh that i want to show for those uh that have it when i go go to data and research you can see all the articles that are out there this this article that i wrote specifically um was more so this was released before the drafters tournament came out so the the tournament tonight that we're we're going to draft is not necessarily where this was thought about but it's totally still applicable it's really just to our early drafts that we're thinking about right now and i want to highlight a couple of those edges so the first thing is rookies um i think that it's not that you can't draft too many rookies because of course you all you always can and as uh uh, jim says uh uh, sickos are driving up the rookies prices in particular malik washington Uh, um i'm gonna we need to come up with a code name so like you guys probably uh experience if you have dogs right so you have dogs um a lot of you probably have dogs or, or 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 children i don't have any children i only have two dogs my wife and i use code words for the words that they now know right uh or you spell them out right they know what toys are they they are obsessed with cheese they know what cheese is they know what a walk is they know right they know all of those words so you end up having your own code language for things that your dog is going to get unnecessary like we can't say cheese in our normal conversation because they get excited they run over and they're like oh it's time for cheese you're going to give me some cheese uh like literally my dog is right over here getting up because i'm saying that word um so we need to come up with a sicko word for malik washington so that i stop 
because I use him in just in when I'm when I think of like, oh, who's the late round rookie wide receiver that like I just want to name drop here to give an example of someone. I say Malik Washington because that's my guy. I it drafted like 85 percent of Malik Washington across my early my early draft. So we need to come up with a code word so that, uh, you know, we can keep our Malik stuff uh, a little bit more under wraps and everybody can get their exposure before he's going in like the 12th round. But obviously he's a rookie. And if you look back at last year, again, from within this article, the thing I wanted to point out specifically was I've heard people say, and I've probably said it, (laughs) I've probably said it in the past. Like I want to target the rookies, but you don't want to target too many rookies, right? It's like, and that may, it makes sense. You're like, man, I'm going to miss on a lot if I draft like a bunch of these rookies. But the only way to find the hits on the rookies is to draft a bunch of them. Because frankly, we don't really have a great idea of exactly who all the hits are going to be. I have my preferences. I'm placing my chips in certain directions. But look at this list. And for the audio listeners, I'll read it really, really quickly. If you drafted a huge amount of players from this list, tell me if you think you would have been excited about having all of them on the same best ball team. Okay. Puka Nakua, Tank Dell, Rashi Rice, CJ Stroud, Sam Laporta, Devin Achan, Zay Flowers, Jaden Reed, Anthony Richardson, before he got hurt, Josh Downs, Jameer Gibbs, Bijan Robinson, Jordan Addison, Ty J Spears, Luke Musgrave, and or Tucker Craft. That doesn't even have Dalton Kincaid. That doesn't even have some other rookies on there who were not bad, right? It also doesn't have uncertain situations, second year players, right? Kyron Williams. It doesn't have those types of players on there. And yet most of our people that we're drafting against are very anti diving into these uncertain situations, specifically rookies, specifically second year players who haven't proven it yet, specifically backup running. Like you're telling me I got to project a backup running back in February. Well, did you see the winning lineup? They took Kyron Williams. You know why they won? Because they took Kyron Williams. And it sounds easy to say, oh, yeah, well, they hit on that. But you know why they hit on these types of things is because we're willing to dive into these uncertain situations like rookies, like backup running backs, like maybe undervalued second-year players, free agents. We don't know where they're going to land. Those kinds of things are just the linchpin to these early drafts and absolutely no one is willing to dive into them to the degree that we probably need to, right? So you can, you can get a structural advantage just by being a a slightly more fragile in terms of your roster spots at certain situations or certain uh, positions. And then you can just dive into the, the unknowns that we know Right, this cohort of players that we know is the unknown, but we do what what isn't uh, what isn't unknown is the fact that the league winners are coming from here. Like it's just a fact. Every year, the league winners come from the uncertain situations. It's not right if it's un, if it's certain they go in a certain spot where it's like yeah, well yeah, Christian McCaffrey. Nothing uncertain about Christian McCaffrey. Nothing uncertain about Justin Jefferson, even his quarterback, I guess, but he's pretty darn good at football, right? Lamar Jackson, spoiler, pretty good at football. Like there's nothing uncertain about these guys. So they get drafted in every draft. They get drafted really highly. People stack the quarterbacks, but they're they're. It's great to have the guys who hit, but they're not the uncertain spots that win you everything, right? You look at that team, Nico Collins, Kyron Williams, I mean, Adam Thielen, who I didn't draft, but Adam Thielen, right? All of those guys are the ones that come together where, oh, they haven't been a superstar yet. And then you fast forward one year and Nico Collins is going in the second round and Kyron Williams is going in the first round. That team didn't even have Sam Laporta, but Sam Laporta is going in the third round. Jake Ferguson is going in the seventh round and he was a second to last round pick, right? It dove into all of those uncertain spots. And it found the guys who are monster, monster breakouts, like you see from these rookies on this screen. So if I'm if I'm personally identifying two things that I'm primarily focused on, it is <clears throat> diving into the roster constructions 
that our opponents are very unwilling to do. My biggest personal takeaway is less roster spots, not necessarily less draft capital, maybe the opposite, but less roster spots on the onesie positions because those are the two spots that are like pretty certain right now. I don't have that much uncertainty around the tight end positions, uh, the tight end position and the quarterback position. There is some, of course, right? Rookies and free agents. But generally speaking, like Lamar's Lamar, Dak is Dak, right? We we understand the rookies. We don't know exactly how they're going to hit, but like Caleb Williams going to be the first overall pick, right? We we get it. Tight ends, yeah, like Brock Bowers, pretty awesome prospect. He's uncertain, but the market's not uncertain about him. Even Kyle Pitts, put him on the thumbnail because I do think he's – individually a uh, specific edge, but this is probably the actual right answer. Vaporware says Pitts is Pitts. He's going to be Kyle Pitts. Disappointment. Charlie Brown, Lucy, Charlie and Lucy with the football is Kyle Pitts. Right. Um, although I think, I think it, it's, it's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fall for it again. Okay. We're just going to get that out of the way, but I don't want to turn this into a Kyle Pitts episode, but you know what I mean? I want to win the flex. I want to win the flex by loading up on as many of the potential league winners, tournament winners, especially on drafters where it's cumulative scoring where like you want like that having Kyron Williams on underdog last year in the last round was, was super impactful. But at the end of the day, if Kyron had a bad week 16 and week 17, it's like, congratulations, enjoy your min cash, right? You made it to week 15 and you lost. But in on drafters here, the, the compounding effect of finding Kyron Williams was so huge, so absolutely massive. You combine the fact that he was not drafted in every single draft in this tournament, and it's like, that's the edge, man. The uncertain situations that also can lead us to different roster construction that can... And See, I told you, I told you, you can't say the, the special keywords around the docs. Now he's sniffing on the bookshelf and everything anyway perfect perfect segue or perfect break not really a perfect segue let's draft let's see let's see if we can put these we are going to get in the drafters ten dollar early uh oh my gosh it's zero out of 12 we're going to join the old fast draft here let's see if we got 11 of you uh 11 of you sickos out there to fill this baby so i can take a drink um, please, please save me and fill this draft. <clears throat> um, I was going to say something else and I already forgot what it was, but, uh, no, check out that article, uh, from Bernie. Seriously. Uh, I've, I've read it like three times today. And it's really, really good. Really, really good. Not because, again, like I pulled up the winning lineup. Not because it, what in the hell is this, Jim? Oh, are you incapable of uh, having a phone around you while you eat? What What does dinner time look like, look like at, the, at the Seward household? Have you never eaten dinner and drafted a best ball team before? find that hard i find that hard to believe um <clears throat> anyway adam says i went puka marvin harrison jr drake london rashad white roma dunze and i'm just aiming for upside and originality at the same time i like that i like this take um i'm gonna be <laughs> jim says my wife wouldn't be pleased yeah welcome to my life welcome well welcome to my life uh, uh, you're drafting a best ball team while you're eating. You drafted a best ball team while you were cooking dinner. Then you drafted a best ball team still while you were eating. And then you walked the dogs after dinner and you drafted a best ball team. Then, then we got in bed and you know, we decided to watch the bachelor and you were drafting a best ball team then, or you were like looking up your exposures during, uh, while we were doing that. Um, and, and you were watching a basketball game on your phone. I don't recommend. I don't recommend um, to anybody. It looks like we need eight more. If anybody would uh, uh, love to join this, that would be swell. So I don't sit here, keep talking about uh, uh, how terrible of a husband I am for too much longer. 
we can get eight more people, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, and our good friends at Drafters would uh, would appreciate it. <laughs> this is good. Liam says drafting a team mid party, mid party. So like, what kind of? I, we got uh, the people got to know Liam. What kind of party? New Year's Eve, Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthday. What was uh, what was what was the? <laughs> Yeah, this is, I will say this, Drafters is uh, sneakily becoming a really, really, really underrated best ball platform. It does drive me a little bit nuts that the, the deposit doesn't happen right away. It takes, it'll, it's going to happen really quickly for you, Billy, I promise. But uh, it doesn't happen right away. Vaporware says, I drafted a 10 rookie team on underdog. Is that too much? I think I'd have to see it ultimately, but my my take is no. And I think that's the big thing that happens People want to put a number to it. So like, uh, it's funny that I say that because I've been talking about putting a number to things like probabilities all day in our Discord, which if you're not in the Spike Week Discord, I'm just going to say, to quote my uh, boss and um, uh, good friend Dan Bach from way back in his Rotor Grinders radio days, he said, if you're not playing Russell Westbrook, you're just going to lose. And that was an NBA DFS reference. That's a kind of how I feel about if you're not in the Spike Week Discord and drafting best ball teams in February, I think you're probably just going to lose specifically on drafters. If you go look at what, who, <laughs> who was winning the drafters tournaments last year, the old one, two punch of our guys, Dorito and Updog taking down first and second for $450,000 combined in the drafters tournament. We're doing all right. The spike week community is doing quite all right, especially on, um, drafters but uh just two more if you're hanging out watching you want to join this this draft we need just uh two more but uh th <laughs> this is pretty funny liam said uh, it was a college party and everyone was in jerseys and no one told liam not only was liam the only one not in a jersey he was drafting best ball teams at the party um so that is that is pretty phenomenal uh, Sean says, uh, oh, this is interesting. Drafted 20 teams during the Super Bowl, and there's so many dead teams in the lobbies. During the Super Bowl, is a I, I kind of like this approach. You get the absolute, like people, maybe they've been drinking. You know, they, they get caught up in the game. They're Ursher fans. Yes, I said Ursher. They're, they're Ursher fans. So the halftime comes, and you're like, the people are going to be distracted, right? Watching Usher and Alicia Keys and Luda up there on the big screen. And I'll get in those drafts and they're going to be dead teams. This is when I'm going to draft my winner while Usher is performing at uh, halftime of the Super Bowl. There we go. All right, we filled the draft. So we'll get this baby rolling here in in just a second. And start to dive into, of course, while well, during the draft, some of the specific player takes that I think can can attach to the edge that we talked about for the first 20 minutes um, or so, but this is an interesting one. Billy, Billy mentions. Um, so Harrison jr. Marvin Harrison jr. Which by the way, uh, <laughs> Mike, I see your comment. If it definitely makes me feel super duper duper old, that Marvin Harrison's son is entering the NFL. Um, I don't have a lot to add, but Marvin Harrison Jr., Frank Gore Jr., Jerry Rice's son. Uh, it's a tough scene. Like, I've never really, I mean, other than my body's broken down, like, I, like, you know, my back and ankles and all that kind of stuff, like, but everybody deals with that getting older. <clears throat> um, I never really have, like, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a fucking backwards hat on YouTube every day like how old can you really feel you look and i look real i get carded you know for anything you know at a at a bar at a, a gas station or whatever I, I i'm i guess luck somewhat lucky in that way but nothing has made me feel quite as old as these guys who i grew up watching and like became a football fan around and their sons coming in while I'm like talking about fantasy football for a living, really, really a tough, like really a tough scene. If we're being, 
if we're being totally honest. Yeah, this is this is good. Carl Pickens' kid, Gabe, our, our good friend Gabe Davis. Carl Pickens' kid made me feel old. I drafted plenty of him and Jeff Blake back in the day. There's a good name drop. All right, I got draft is started for the audio listeners. I got the 103. Uh, our good friend Shuby took Jamar Chase 101. I'm intrigued by that. Christian McCaffrey goes 102 to Lens. I'm going to take CeeDee Lamb. Uh, 103. But as uh, as a shout out to Billy. Um, Billy is on Twitter. I, Billy, I apologize. I forget what your Twitter handle is. Everybody needs to go follow him. Uh, he's doing some good work for us behind the scenes that you will see more of very, very soon. In particular, a zero RB article that is going to be straight fire. But Billy says, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is an interesting conversation point because he carries some uncertainty. He hasn't played a snap in the NFL. We don't, and not only has he not played a snap, we don't know what team he's going to be on. So like, it's one thing to have not played a snap, but be in an awesome situation. It's another thing to not have played a snap. And we don't like, it's not impossible. He's on the Patriots, (laughs) you know, which like, okay, then we're going to do this mental gymnastics of is the target volume, the target share better than being on a high scoring offense. Right. But, we, but that's all the uncertainty that we just don't have. Like, he carries some uncertainty. Yeah, he carries a lot of uncertainty with Marvin Harrison. We're pretty darn sure he's awesome, but he sure as shit better be to be going in the second round, right? But, as Billy says, he has immense upside at a relatively expensive cost. So, it's like, the other thing I would say is, if I'm investing, <clears throat> um. Shout out to our good friend, uh, Pat Kareen and um, his work that he's doing over at Legendary Upside. But they just did a recent Dynasty uh, rankings review podcast with him and Davis Maddock and Jacob Sanderson. And they talked about, uh, uh, Pat frequently mentions, like a place to uh, store value right in dynasty circles we're not storing value in best ball we're trying to capture value uh in a single season but marvin harrison is one of those like a great store of value in that even if he's not awesome as a rookie like the floor still somehow despite the fact he's never played an nfl game (laughs) is like kind of high for best ball because like any team that drafts him of course is going to utilize him because they are not very good. They probably don't have awesome. He's instantly going to be the guy, but B you are incentivized a little bit to prove that he was the right guy type of a thing. Um, I, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but such is life. I, I I'm pretty into, uh, I got, I got to fix these. Uh, I gotta, I gotta go in and change my draft hacker colors. But, um, anyway, for, for folks that are not, uh, that are new, to this i'll scroll I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit you see our draft hacker at work here um i've only done one it's really not that important to see right now because this is only my second drafters draft but as we get into this a little bit over the course of the next couple of weeks i'll make sure that you can see you obviously see here uh in my drafters draft i drafted chris olave so you see 100 percent of him and then um uh, you guys can't see it but if you hover over these other percentages you can see what they mean i'll explain it in just a second. I am going to take Tank Dell, actually. Um, I like Olave, but I, I really don't have a lot of a lot of Tank Dell just, just yet. And I'm fascinated by the Texans. Um, but quickly started CeeDee Lamb, Devontae Adams, and Tank Dell. And yes, Sean points out. Sean points out, uh, picking out of the 1.12 is username Elon Musk with an Elon Musk uh, avatar. It's pretty interesting. Uh, perfect time to answer this question. Mike Robb says, uh, you know, so I mentioned Dan Bach uh, from Roto Grinders. Uh, does that mean Kitchen is your boss? If he is, may the Lord be with you and you need a raise. I'll agree with the final part, the uh, raise, but no, Kitchen is not my boss. Kitchen is my coworker. Uh, hope you're listening, Dave. I love you. I get along really, really well with Dave. He is a great person. He is an awesome uh, member of this whole industry, and he's been a great coworker for me for the the years that I've been 
uh, around. Uh, I actually started at Roto Grinders before Dave did, uh, and then we bought Fantasy Insiders. Which, okay, this is no one tell Dave that this happened. But um, for anybody that knows Dave Kitchen, I literally am rocking a Fantasy Insiders uh, shirt underneath underneath the hoodie today. So uh, shout out Kitchen and the Fantasy Insiders. But no, not my boss, coworker. And he's the best. I can't believe he puts up with the, I mean, I can't believe we put up with him, but I can't believe he puts up with Pete and Davis every week. Can you imagine? I can't, I can't imagine. Um, all right, let's do a little quick review of where everything is standing here. looks a little bit like a, it, as would be expected when it is 12 of us sicko degenerates. Pretty wide receiver heavy. Um, the folks were soaking up the that top tier of running backs: CMC, Brees, Bijan, Gibbs, Kyron, Achan, and Jonathan Taylor. Uh, but then once that very smart room, we're in a very good, very smart room here, which is a little tilting, but such is life. After JT, no running back went until Saquon at 32 overall in the third round, which I actually think, um, a, I still wouldn't take Saquon there, but it, it's at least defensible. But uh, this is much more so how I think a lot of drafts should go with once you hit Jonathan Taylor or HN, whatever. Um, I actually have HN a lot lower than this, but uh, we don't need to get into that today. I think that it's like should be wide receiver, quarterback, tight end heavy for a long time after Jonathan Taylor. I understand if you like Travis Etienne. I understand if you like Saquon or Pacheco or let me look at the running backs. James Cook, Ken Walker, like Rashad White. If you like them, that's fine. But I, I, my talk about edges, talk about the things that we think are edges. I don't really care if you take two, like, I don't care how you start your drafts. Like from a structural perspective, I think hero running back, meaning one of those elite guys, one of JT and above, or zero running backs, meaning we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait on on running back till seventh, eighth, ninth plus rounds. I think those are the the best structural edges. But realistically, as long as you're kind of abandoning running back Taylor, I really don't have a problem with anything that anybody does uh, after that. So, uh, you know, kind of speaking through some of those edges, that's kind of how I'm feeling. Let's see here. God, you guys are brutal, man. I am going to take... I, I'm going to take Amari. I don't really like him. I'll be totally honest with you, but it's Amari... Uh, Amari is the uh, Amari is the 29 year old running back of wide receivers for me. There's almost nothing. There's almost nothing anyone can say or do to make me excited about him. But I know, and part of part of myself, I've gotten a little better at this game, or I think I've gotten better. Is <clears throat> setting aside my biases and being like, you don't want Amari Cooper, but you also should be cognizant of the fact that just because of your arch archetypical, archetypal um, biases doesn't mean that that makes him a bad pick. I am going to take Terry McLaurin here, who I am I'm becoming more and more bullish on. Yeah, this is so true. Sean says it's the Najee Harris effect. And it's funny, if you have the Almanac that I uh, cited earlier, uh, my guy B. Curd in the chat, Bernie and I had a nice long conversation about the Pittsburgh Steelers and specifically Najee Harris, who you'll find, uh, spoiler alert, in our rankings. I actually have, for the first time in the existence of Spike Week, for the first time in since I've ever done best ball content, we are higher then market on Najee Harris in our rankings. I won't spoil anything else. Just go listen to the roundtable today with Beaker and myself. We dive into 
um, all all of that. But uh, it is it is one hundred percent the Najee Harris effect. It is. I don't like you. It, it becomes ingrained in your brain that like I don't like that guy. He's not the type of player I like. He's been overpriced, right? Am- Amari to me, quite frankly, has been overpriced for some time. Certain uh, Najee, like it, Najee, is the is the absolute like shout out Sean, the perfect example. I don't have anything bad to say about Najee. It was just the pr- it's price. Like I don't dislike Najee Harris. Like, I'm sure he's a fine person. I think I don't know. He, I'm sure his family is nice. I'm sure if I met him, I'd really like him. But, like, I'm not going to draft him in the first round or second round <laughs> fantasy football drafts. It doesn't make any sense. I've gotten a lot of thing wrong, a lot of things wrong over the years, but <laughs> baiting Najee has been a pretty successful, pretty successful strategy. Now, however, the market has dumped him. They're done. Totally done with Najee Harris. Right? Let's see. ADP of 91. That's low. Why was Najee going in the <laughs> second round for these last? Like, why was Najee going as a top four round pick? And now, after he actually showed something kind of good down the stretch, Arthur Smith is in town. Now we're going to dump him like to round pick 100. I don't know. It's a market game. And Najee Harris, the Najee Harris effect is the the best, probably the best example of that. Vaporware says that uh, Najee gives back to the community, which is fucking awesome. So yeah, I'll happily be a Najee Harris fan this year. Found me. Um, All right, let's see. Run down some of the uh, Billy Joe takes Chris Godwin. No, <clears throat> Billy Joe, shout out Billy in the chat, picking out of the tenth spot starts Jameer Gibbs and Devin Achan, which I definitely am, am fine with, um, approve of. Even though I'm personally a little bit lower on Achan, I have JT over Achan, but I don't really have a problem with that start. <clears throat> and then it's like, all right, you're in a wide receiver heavy room. You started running back, running back. How do you start to recover from that? Billy is crushing it. Um, the only like pushback I would have is uh, taking CJ Stroud as your quarterback without Nico or Tank. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of stacking here once to see if I can put together <laughs> some stacks. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, elaborate too much on stacking edges and then screw it up myself. But that's kind of how it goes on on draft streams. But Billy recovers, right? Michael Pittman, third round pick, looks good. Devonta Smith, I, I kind of think is a pretty fun buy low um, or buy the dip uh, uh, from last year. CJ Stroud and Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin specifically being one of my favorite uh, targets. Let's look here a little bit. Oof. Ooh, we got to pick 70. Oh, no. I'm going to take Dak. So there we go. I actually don't totally love the Dak price, but I just feel like um, I want to have myself some some Dak CD. And, and the sixth, sixth slash early seventh round is not some cost prohibitive price for Dak Prescott. It's totally fine. So um, I'm totally comfortable doing some of that. It's I'm, I don't think Dak is like at this price, but he's also not uh, like I'm not running away from, from Dak Prescott. Um, let's see here. Running back. My next pick is 94, which I think is going to end up locking me out of the tight end group that I want. So do I take Ferg or Pitts? We're going to Dallas. We're going to Dallas it up here. Take Jake Ferguson. Uh, so so I have started for a quick recap. CeeDee Lamb out of the 103. Devontae Adams in the second round. 
Uh, there'll be more content on, on Devontae Adams, I promise you, because it's a rare breed for me to be very into Devontae Adams uh, this year. I was out uh, mostly on Devontae last year, which was fine until week 17. Jesus Christ, Devontae Adams took every last um, fiber of my successful fade on him in week 17 and just stopped all, all over it with his week 17 game. But I'm kind of back in actually at the price now on Devontae Adams. CeeDee Lamb, Devontae Adams, Tank Dell, Amari Cooper, and Terry McLaurin. McLaurin is a guy who I am uh, uh, I'm pretty into. I'm, I'm pretty into, I think, getting a quarterback upgrade uh, from Howell slash Brissett to um, either Caleb Williams or Drake May or, or Jaden Daniels I think is going to be awesome getting coaching uh, okay, I don't want to be super negative about Eric B enemy, right? But just a reset, a reset in Washington is, is much needed. And, um, I think Terry McLaurin really separated himself from, from that group. Not, not like in a crazy way, but I think we were, it was much more like, okay, Terry is like a fourth round pick and Dotson is like a seventh round pick, maybe even sixth by the end of the summer last year. We didn't really know. We didn't have a great um idea of how things would shake out there despite the fact that terry has really dominated targets dotson looked promising as a second year player i feel pretty confident that um it's terry's world and john dotson is just living in it uh moving forward and i think there's there's quite a bit of upside there's not a lot of wide receivers in these you know rounds three rounds two through six or something where i feel like yeah okay th- their talent their upside and everything can really exceed this price. Um, but I do think Terry McLaurin is actually one of them. If Washington turns around a little bit and he continues to kind of be the lead dog there, I think this could be like, why is Terry McLaurin ultimately that much different from Debo Waddle Olave? Like Olave seems like a reasonable, a kind of comp to Terry McLaurin. And frankly, McLaurin used to go there in like a, in, in a similar area of the draft. Um, I don't think Olave is especially more talented than Terry McLaurin. I don't think he's on a especially better offense. I don't think he has a much cleaner path to more targets. I think if anything, Washington probably has more upside as an offense, right? They trade up to get Caleb or, or Drake may or whatever happens. Um, I think Terry could be a, a pretty, a pretty fun pick. So I'm, I'm kind of prioritizing uh, Terry McLaurin, but then come back and <clears throat> round six, seven, eight, nine or so are weird, weird rounds. Um, and so, uh, I just, we just closed out a little Dallas stack here. We're, we're betting on Dallas with Dak Prescott and Jake Ferguson needed a tight end, needed a quarterback. Uh, now obviously you'll see me pull, uh, uh, my, what? I, sure. Yeah, I'm a. I, mean, I don't know why Cole Turner, uh, GA says you're a Washington Bull though. After Cole Turner last year, uh, Cole Turner isn't the first Washington guy that I would uh, uh, point out that I was a bull on. But uh, and yes, uh, Bernie, uh, I, I guess that's like an attempt at a dunk. Yeah, I did draft Cole Turner uh, last year. I might draft some Cole Turner again here this early cycle uh, to see if they cut Logan Thomas and don't draft up. Uh, another tight end, but yeah, much more famously, I was a Sam Howell, Sam Howell, Tara McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, uh, bull last year. And I'm, I'm, I'm back in on Washington, although it's mostly McLaurin, uh, McLaurin, Brian Robinson, really interested to see what goes on with their tight end situation. Cause I think there's a lot of potential on whoever is the tight end, um, there, which is why I drafted Cole Turner and why I drafted Logan Thomas. Uh, not a lot of, it's, it's very rare to get overweight two tight ends on the same team to draft more than eight. I think I had 12% uh, Cole Turner and 13% Logan Thomas or something like that. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to do. Uh, we whiffed, we whiffed on both, but uh, nonetheless, it was fun. Oof. All right. Let's see. This is Bernie's going to, crucify me if i don't draft mike williams i'm gonna take i'm gonna take mike williams all right i can't dive in i'm not gonna dive all the way into this one because again of course we talked about it on um the round table today from the almanac but i 
I think I'm going to move Mike Williams up a little bit. You see, I took him here at pick, uh, what, 100? Yeah, pick 100 uh, or 99. Pick 99. <clears throat> I don't really love Mike Williams. And if you use, you're using our rankings, I have him uh, lower than this. So this is the first time I've drafted Mike Williams. Congratulations. Welcome to history. The first time uh, Eric Manford drafts Mike Williams in 2024. But I've been I've been persuaded a little bit that he he can really make some sense on some best ball teams where at this cost, you know, pick 100 and beyond. We're we're really buried like like 2 years ago Mike Williams, you know, Mike Lombardi was in uh uh I almost said San Diego. Was uh, with the Chargers and it was the whole he's this is our Michael Thomas. Right, Michael Mike Williams is going to be the next guy. Uh, he's going to draw more targets this year. He's not just a contested catch guy. He's not just a down the field guy. Was he sort of? But when he's been active, he's been really good for fantasy. And it, I, Mike Williams, profiles to me very similarly to what we see with T. Higgins and Mike Evans and those kinds of free agent wide receivers. But because it's been such a weird roller coaster ride, specifically of injuries, so the injuries are very much a concern. But we're burying him, like absolutely burying him. T. Higgins probably went in what the fourth round of this draft, yeah, forty third overall. And I mean, I like T. Higgins better. I like Mike Evans much better. I like those guys better. But we've decided. Them, it's over for Mike Williams and we're done with him. But like when you look at the guys like Keon Coleman, Khalil Shakir, like he got drafted between Keon Coleman and Khalil Shakir in a best ball draft. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So I've started to sort of reset my uh, mind on Mike Williams. And uh, when he sucks, I'm blaming Bernie. Uh, I'm, I'm blaming Bernie for this. Yeah, no, I trust me. Uh, Shuby says wrong side of 30 ACL injury, you know, no team right now. De no, trust me. I agree with you. I, I have some like monster, monster concerns, but also everybody does. Everybody does. Um, let me see here. All right. I definitely got to start diving into some running backs. Devin Singletary. Uh, I'm going to try to double dip this tier. I'm going to take Zamir. I got to stay true to the brand. Uh, Zamir is my favorite guy from this pocket of the draft. Apparently this stream, we're just running back everything that we talked about on the round table today, but this pocket of running backs is, I actually sort of wish now, if I had it to do over again <clears throat> on a zero running back team, like I have here, I wish I would have pulled up one of the running backs from this group. Zamir, Ty Chandler, um, it's just who I'm going to take here uh, is Ty Chandler. But uh, like Shuby took Blake Corum and Jonathan Brooks, uh, two rookie running backs who I really, really like. Uh, but there's also Devin Singletary, Roshan Johnson, Chuba Hubbard, Charbonnet, Ford, Khalil Herbert. Like this whole tier. All these guys. I mean, Jalen Warren went right before this. Javante went right before this. Chase Brown. All of those guys. Uh, Marine Moster, who is who, funny enough, uh, uh, Elon Musk took in this draft, who I was kind of talking about how I need to move down, I think, in the rankings a little bit, which some people may uh, disagree with. But at pick 109, <laughs> uh, pick 109 for Raheem Mostert is pretty good. This whole collection of running backs right here, Again, speaking about edges that exist right now, I think this might be the big, the, the the single biggest one. Even more so than rookies, even more so than uncertain situations, even more so than our basic roster construction. From an actionable thing that I'm doing myself right now in in drafts, I'm drafting predominantly zero running back teams, and this pocket of the draft, as you now see with them flying off the fucking board. <laughs> Like running backs didn't go for multiple rounds earlier, and now, okay, most dirt. Right, so uh, let's go all the way back. Nick Chubb, 
in round nine at 102. Here's all the running backs that have gone in two rounds. Nick Chubb, Tony Pollard, DeAndre Swift, Raheem Mostert, Chase Brown, Javante Williams, Jalen Warren, Zamir White, Blake Corum, Jonathan Brooks, Ty Chandler, Devin Singletary, Roshan Johnson, Chuba Hubbard. Uh, Charbonnet's probably about to go. Jerome Ford's probably about to go. Khalil Herbert, Kendra Miller. All these guys are going to go within this little three for within three rounds. We're going to get 20 running backs who maybe a slight exaggeration, but not that much. We're going to get 15 plus running backs go. And they are all realistically like no offense to the people who are drafting Derrick Henry and Austin Eckler and those kinds of guys. Realistically, these guys are really not that different um, from those guys. The only difference is name brand recognition, recognition of the guys that go a little bit above them. So this is a pocket of the draft that I believe like do whatever you want to do in the first couple of rounds, draft, whatever quarterback you want to draft. Like I, I don't think like any quarterback is some edge right now. Personally. Um, I like, I like Jaden Daniels. I like Kyler Murray. I like, like the rookies. I like those guys, but I'm, I, I'm not like taking some monster stand at quarterback at tight end. I think the elite tight ends are an edge Ferguson, Pitts and Joku, Kelsey, Andrews, Bowers, right? All, they, all those guys, I think that they are an edge, but it's not any one of them specifically. I, I shouldn't say that. David and Joku's up there as an edge for me. But realistically, none of them are like some crazy, crazy, crazy edge. But a one collection of players through in like a little two to three round pocket is these running backs that are like, this perfect combination of high floor, mega high upside that could be going like almost any of them could be going in like the fourth round when we flip over the cards after the NFL draft. It's just that the uncertainty around all of them is keeping their prices in check, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because Derrick Henry has uncertainty and Tony Pollard has uncertainty and Austin Eckler has uncertainty, but they have the name brand. Whereas Zamir white and Ty Chandler and Devin Singletary and, and Chuba Hubbard and these guys don't have the name brand recognition. And so they go in rounds 10, 11 and 12, whereas those other guys go before and I can get this, what I believe to be a very similar type bet, which is, I don't exactly like, I don't know for sure what Zamir White's going to be. Is he going to be the starting running back for the Raiders or is he going to be the backup or is he going to be in a timeshare? I don't know. But the ceiling case is that Zamir White is the just like we saw down the stretch for the final month of 2023. Zamir White is the freaking lead running back, starting running back on a run first, run heavy, solid Vegas Raiders offense. He's got his coach back. Josh Jacobs is a free agent. They are, are spending $30 million on Jimmy G to hold the clipboard on the sideline. They're not exactly, you know, uh, free of financial uh, obligations. There's a lot of reasons why Zamir White ends up back as the starter, but the market is just not, not buying it. You know, they're not buying it. Let's see here. All right. We're going to go. We're going to go back to my guy, Kendra. Kendra is apparently, uh, I clearly got to hammer some running backs. But also why I think my structure to go back to the edges about structure. I think zero RB slash zero RB is a, is an edge, <clears throat> but it, it has a lot to do with this pocket where I have the potential to get freaking Shuby. It's taking all the, all the backs here. I think I'm going to take S to May. First rookie, yeah, we're going to take the first rookie running back and bet on one of the more uncertain situations. But this is how I like to build my running back rooms, especially in these early drafts where, like, when we get to August, we're going to know who the starting running backs are. <clears throat> You're not going to be able to have the chance to, like, wait till round 10 and possibly get multiple workhorse running backs. You might, like, I'm going to be preaching if you come back to this channel. Hit, hit subscribe and you'll get notified. I'm not going to be breaching uh, zero RB for the same reasons 
as I'm preaching it right now. Right now, I can draft Samir White in round 10 and Ty Chandler in round 11 and Audric Estime in, in round 13 and possibly get three starting workhorse running backs on the same roster in double-digit rounds. Is that going to happen? Do I know if it's going to happen? Obviously not. But I, it's possible. By the time we get to August, if there's a round 10 running back, he's a backup, right? Or like a, at best, it's last year's Jalen Warren. At best. Last year's Antonio Gibson, right? So like he's like the 60-40, Brian Robinson, Antonio Gibson's 40. You're like, it's fine. Hopefully he can help me if they're both healthy and he has contingent value is like, right. That's the thesis around those running backs. But right now in this range is all those guys that I just read off to you before. Like Javante Williams is the lead running back for the Denver Broncos. Say whatever you want about him and the Broncos, but he's the lead running back for the Denver Broncos. Zamir white might be the lead running back for the Raiders, right? Blake Corum might be the lead running back for the chargers. (laughs) Jonathan Brooks, Probably not the lead running back for anybody in week one, but might be the lead running back for where he lands at some point um, early to mid to late part of the season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm just trying to use that to my advantage. Do I know exactly that it's going to work out? No, I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you and tell you that I know for sure Ty Chandler is going to be the Viking starting running back. You have to draft him, but it let's call it a coin flip. It's a 50-50 coin flip. And the downside of taking Ty Chandler in the 11th round is he's like playing 30% of the snaps. I'll take it. And the upside is he's a workhorse starting running back on the Minnesota Vikings in round 11. When other people are paying, when other people are paying round six prices for David Montgomery, who I know is not going to be a workhorse running back at any point at ever unless Jameer Gibbs gets hurt. And I like David Montgomery, but you get the point. Um, I see your comments. I'll make this, we'll make this pick and then uh, a couple of good, good, uh, interesting concepts. Uh, Let me put, let me put my guys here. Did, uh, we got to take Elijah Mitchell. Elijah Mitchell for sure. I, I saw the, I saw Benjamin. I saw your comment, Vapor. I saw your comment. We'll we'll get through this turn, and then we will uh, <clears throat> digest some of that for sure. Oof. All right, let's see. Got my guy Ray Davis. Man, we have really priced up Ray Davis though on uh, on drafters. I, I should have looked at okay. See, I screwed this up now. Oh, thank God we clicked around. It's easily Michael Mayer here. Easily Michael Mayer. Close out tight end and see. So now to the structural uh, conversation from before Ferg and Michael Mayer are going to be my only two tight ends. I don't feel the need to dive into Chig, Davis Allen, Brevin Jordan. I understand that they could possibly be hits, but my whole goal is to win the flex. I have Dak Prescott. I have Jake Ferguson. I have Michael Mayer. Those guys <clears throat> if I'm right about them are going to do what we saw on that winning team before, which actually happened to have Jake Ferguson, but I have Mark Andrews and Jake Ferguson and Dak Prescott and Jared Goff. And the scores like those guys provide, especially in this early tournament, we exaggerate what we need from the the quarterback position specifically, but the quarterback and tight end position, we exaggerate what we need from those two spots. If we are winning the flex, we are going to put ourselves in a chance to win this tournament. 
the quarterbacks are probably going to be good enough. The tight ends are probably going to be good enough, right? If we hit to a certain level. Now, Jake Ferguson is a total bust and Michael Mayer is a total bust. So be it. Dak Prescott gets hurt. So be it. This team is gone. If if those happen, it doesn't matter. This team's not winning anyway, right? This team is not winning with Noah Gray as a third tight end to save Jake Ferguson being hurt and Michael Mayer being useless. It's, nothing is saving that situation. But what we can, what can catapult us from a min cash to winning the whole tournament is banking on Jake Ferguson continuing to be a fantasy stud, banking on Michael Mayer taking a leap in year two, and banking on Dak Prescott to continue to be the stud that he was that won that gentleman uh, this tournament last year. And then being like, okay, those those happened. Now what? And now how do I win? Well, it's probably running backs and wide receivers. Because if I win the flex... I'm scoring more points at six positions than the rest of my competitors like every week. <laughs> like it at right, the Kyron Williams thing was helping people score in the flex more often than more points more often than all of our competitors. And like ultimately that's my goal. Win the flex. And if that and if it takes me sacrificing some teams that could have been good. Ah, oh, this team could have been good, but you should have, if you would have taken that third quarterback, it would have helped. I'm okay making that sacrifice because I want to optimize the teams that didn't need that third quarterback and give them the juice at running back and wide receiver because I know I'm going to miss, dude. Like, did you see the team that won? Five players that scored zero points for the team. <laughs> Five. I know I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss at least five times. That was the team that won the whole fucking tournament. Had five goose eggs. Zeros. So how many times am I going to miss on these teams? More than five, probably. So if that team's going to miss that much, uh, I should probably think about what that means for my team and be like, shit, I, I would rather optimize for the situation when I don't miss. Like, I, I, I want to find the team that doesn't miss five times. All right, I do need to take a running back while I'm while I'm rambling, and I only got three seconds. So, oh, no. J.K. Dobbins. We autoed J.K. Dobbins. First J.K. Dobbins share. Hate that. You want to know how you win the flex? You auto-pick uh, J.K. Dobbins with the torn Achilles. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure. That's the answer. Ramble about winning the flex and then auto draft. Like you ramble so long that you auto draft. JK Tom. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, we're going to take Will Levis. Every time. Can guarantee it. GA says the flex rant to auto drafting. At least we auto drafted a running back. Would have been really. It would have been much better if we auto drafted a third tight end. Dirt while, while rambling about uh, about the flex, then auto draft a player who can't fucking play in the flex. That would have been much. That would have been much better. Um. Anyway, all right. Some uh, comments. I I love the people that are only here to comment to like get the get the digs in it's great um dorito says not an evan ingram fan no not not, not really um i i need to like reassess this one a little bit i'm curious what you what um uh, someone like dorito who uh, drafters nfl best ball champion dorito uh, it th like Evan Ingram is such a fascinating guy where I, I feel like he's really overpriced. Um, let's see here. S scroll back really quickly. I guess on drafters, it's okay. 83 overall. That's okay. That's okay. But like, I feel like I'm missing something. Not a lot of big weeks from, from Evan Ingram. 
Jacksonville, not uh, uh yeah, I, th- I think that this is, I think this is fair. Investor better says, uh, at least Ingram is priced about right. I, 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 I think you guys nailed it. I think, yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like he's actually. This is so true. I feel like he's actually bad, but scores a lot of points in this in this format. Um, Shuby says PPR PPR helps him, and investor better says maybe only one round over price. I think I, I, I agree with you guys. I think he's in a in a a right price range, and I'm I'm gonna try to open myself up to it a little bit more. I think I think he's not very good at football. I think he's not that great of a fantasy asset, but I do think ultimately, I mean, we'll see what happens with Calvin Ridley. That'll be um, a domino that could definitely impact this, this take. But I think he's just a guy where it's like, I, I struggle to even like put it into words, right? Where he's fine. Like it's fine. I don't have, I'm not, I, I'm not sitting here ranting about him. Uh, like second round Najee Harris, where I was like, if you take him, you're, you know, I think that you're playing this game wrong. I don't, I don't think that about Evan Ingram, but I just don't think he's ever a piece where I'm like, this guy's going to win me this tournament. Like he just, there is no ceiling case. There, there is no, there, uh, there is weekly upside. And I do agree with you guys that this format definitely helps Evan Ingram. And so theoretically, that's a good, that's a good best ball asset at tight end, right? But like there is never a scenario where he elevates from this tier to a higher end tight end tier. Like it, it doesn't exist. I, so like, I hate those guys like as, and, and this can be a hundred percent bias, but like when Kyle Pitts hits, when Michael Mayer hits, when Sam Laporta hit last year, when those guys hit, they hit in such a way that it elevates them from this tier to a completely different tier. And we're drafting them. And like we get the next year, we get sticker shock. I want to draft the guys that give me sticker shock the next year. Right. Like Tank Dell, like I still have sticker shock over Puka, <laughs> like every draft. I'm like Jesus Christ, Puka Nakua, seventh overall. Like that's crazy. I want to, but I want to draft the guys where the next year I'm like, oh my God, I have sticker shock over them. Evan Ingram, that it is not in the range of outcomes. Never, never, never possible. But I also don't want to be so biased ab- about that, uh, that like, you know, concept, if that makes sense. All right, we got to make up for this. Uh, did one of you, I knew it. Somebody already took Malik Washington. Um, somebody take Yoshi. Yep. Oh shit. If I can't get Yoshi, I'm gonna take Charlie Jones. Jesus. Uh Yoshi is going 178. Malik Washington went 189. Boy. I gotta get used to these prices. Uh, but I am going to close this. Ronnie Rivers goes fucking Shuby. You guys are killing me, man. You guys are absolutely killing me. And a bit ba- and lemmings takes a band to lemmings. Are you watching? I don't think we've ever like totally fully interacted. You're a mega sharp best ball grinder, but you got to, you, you know that I like, a ban I'm taking Cody Schrader. I got to take some, I need some juice at running back, some upside. Um, maybe you don't believe that Cody Schrader is that juice, but I, uh, I definitely need some upside. And I think that the rookies are probably the right bet for me here. Um, I also will say, uh, I'm, I'm pretty into, uh, Oh, another Paul, Paul V lemmings here. Shout out. To you, Paul. Thank you for thank you for joining us. I highly doubt that you're terribly sorry. I highly doubt it. Congratulations on uh, Izzy Abanikanda. But uh, um, no, it's funny. Like literally, Rivers and Abanikanda were the two guys that I was going to take, and then you and fucking Shuby take them back to back right before me. I can't get any of the guys I like here. Washington, Javon Baker, Elon Musk took Javon Baker. 
Is Elon in the chat? Elon, step away from the Tesla. Uh, I, you're not a subscriber because you drafted Miles Sanders 204 overall, but you did draft Javon Baker, who is one of my guys. I, I'm not enjoying this draft very much. I'll be totally honest with you. We're we're drafting a stream where we're trying to talk about the edges that exist here, and every time I come on the clock, you guys have taken all the guys who I think are uh, are edges. Yes, Christopher. Christopher says Mizzou legend and Cotton Bowl MVP Cody Schrader and former Truman State running back and Mizzou walk on Cody Schrader. Yeah. Um, again, check out the Almanac Schrader and, and, and check out our rankings. Cody Schrader, one of my guys. Um, he's a great example. I don't want to uh, ramble. <clears throat> and screw up my pick again like I did earlier on J.K. Dobbins. But Cody Schrader is an example of one of the guys that I'm 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 just going to draft every year. I understand the bear case that everyone will make on someone like Cody Schrader. Not certainly not a big recruit. That's how you end up at Truman State. And that's how you end up walking on at the University of Missouri. Um not a perfect prospect. He's he's certainly not going to run four three. He's not two thirty. Um, fine pass catcher, I think. Uh, can catch passes. Can pass protect. He's not Jameer Gibbs. He's not Christian McCaffrey. He's not Bijan. Imperfect prospect. But you know what Cody Schrader does is uh, to to quote my my favorite. Uh, recent article and movie I've now watched a couple times in the last uh, week or so, Moneyball. Uh, check out the article on the website, that the Moneyball approach to best ball. You know what Cody Schrader does? He fucking gets on base, right? Like Cody Schrader is that guy that if Moneyball existed, everyone would be like the scouts. If Moneyball existed in this world that we live in, the scouts would be like, too small, too slow, not a big recruit, not a perfect pass catch. They would be knocking every flaw that he has. And yet, all those flaws may exist from a scouting perspective. And guess what he does? 1,600 yards in the SEC. Oh, Tennessee, you have a top five run defense in the country? Here's 200 on your head. Like, the kid just balls. Like I, at a certain point, we got to stop caring about all the shit we used to care about, like what they look like with their shirt off and what they do at the combine and like all that. At a certain point, being a football player is being a football player. And I'm not saying Cody Schrader will amount to anything. He might not, he might not be good enough, but where I would rather lose on the players who have showed me that again, with Moneyball, you showed me, you could get on base. I'll take my chance. If you can't get on base, it's Keon Coleman. Keon Coleman does not get on base. Keon Coleman catches a few touchdowns, but he doesn't really get on base. Like, I, I, I'm not going to dive into those guys. I'm going to dive into the guys who have consistently just balled out in college. Good Lord. I, we're going to scroll until we find a running back that we don't hate drafting. Actually, I kind of like Chris Brooks. I need to star him before I... Uh, all right, Chris Brooks it is. I kind of don't hate Chris Brooks. I know that that's a while, maybe a little bit of a wild take, but um, it's not inconceivable that Chris Brooks is in the mix, I think, for the Dolphins this year. I want to mix him in a little bit. I think he makes some good sense on, on draft. Or it makes good sense in all these early tournaments. But uh, quick rundown of the team here. Um, interesting. Certainly, if you know me, very zero RB, but also it goes to, if you listen to the top, kind of the structural edges that I think nobody will ever do. Like the amount of two eight eight two teams that are going to be in this tournament is so minuscule. You can get an edge from something just so simple as that right off the jump. Excuse me. We went Dak Prescott, Will Levis at quarterback. Didn't talk a lot about Will Levis. <laughs> Not exactly my favorite football player, but at pick 195, QB two to Dak Prescott. Totally cool with that. 
talked a lot about the running back tier where I started my running back room with Zamir White, Ty Chandler, Kendra Miller, Audric Estime, where it is just um, a room that could be, um, th- this team could finish last, <laughs> right? If all these teams, you know, if Estime lands somewhere where it's not advantageous and the Raiders and the Vikings bring somebody in to where those guys are backups, it's not going to be pretty. But the upside is that all of these guys land in like much bigger roles. And the next thing you know, you have a supercharged team because it has Elijah Mitchell, J.K. Dobbins, Cody Schrader, and Chris Brooks to close it out. But more importantly, it has CeeDee Lamb, Devontae Adams, Tank Dell, Amari Cooper, Terry McLaurin, Troy Franklin, Mike Williams, and then our, our guy Chuck Jones with the, the Bengals, Jake Ferguson, and Michael Mayer. Um, I enjoyed this team. I enjoyed this team. Uh, quickly. Yeah, uh, we got we got some Mizzou, got some Mizzou love. We got some Washington Husky love. We got some Eli Drinkowitz love. I don't know. I don't know. How I feel about it. feel about that one. But uh, agree with Vaporware. Fun stream. Enjoy enjoyed hanging out with you guys. Ton of fun. Hit that like button on your way get, on your on your way out. Christopher, please do come back and join us. We'll be drafting a lot of a lot of best ball teams. A lot of best ball teams here over the course of the next uh, well long time long time that's what we do here but uh be on the lookout uh follow the twitter account and join the discord of course hit like and subscribe you'll get notified that way too but if you if you would like to get notified you know on twitter uh or in the discord there's notifications going on about the shows where we also have non live stream video and media content that's coming out specifically this week we got some really really fun stuff around some rookies and some draft strategy stuff coming out this week that you're going to enjoy so go ahead follow us like subscribe all that fun stuff and be on the lookout coming soon this week very very soon and on through the next few weeks and next few months of best ball season had a lot of fun see you guys promo code spike on drafters promo code spike on drafters and we'll see you guys next week peace Woo! those were some spicy takes want to stay up to date with all of the other spicy takes we're going to have over here at spike week why don't you press that subscribe button below if you turn notifications on we draft a team boom you know about it we have another spicy take boom you know about it you can be there you can draft with us you want to stay up to date That's how you do it. All right, we'll catch you later next time here at Spike Week.